appeal in the matter of the Queen on the application of EG and the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Yes, Mr. Camps, I'm aware of that page. In this um, appeal and these applications, I appear for the Secretary of State together with my learned friend William Irwin. Um, learned friend Amanda Weston, Queen, Queen Councillor, and learned friend Miranda Butler appear for the respondent, who uh, is known in this court as EG. Um, I'll say something about that in, in a second. Um, the court also has written submissions from the intervener, um, drafted by uh, Samantha Knights of Queen's Council um, and uh, Asia Christie. Um, but they, they are not present in court today. I don't know whether in ordinary circumstances one of them might have attended, but uh, your, the court should have them, and, and, and they, they are the counsel for the intervener. Um, uh, the um, respondent um, was known as EOG before Mr Justice Mostyn, but in accordance with this court's usual practice, she's now been anonymised as EG. Um, I just raise a question uh, which doesn't have to be resolved now as, as to whether or not one might want to be consistent um, with what's below, uh, with the, the uh, anonymisation below, in particular because um, Mr Justice Mostyn's judgment has now been reported in the weekly reports as EOG. Um, we have... Yeah, it should be consistent, Mr I'm grateful. So, so, so perhaps we can do the necessary administratively to, yes, to make it EOG. Um, the, we have got copies in court somewhere of the weekly law, law reports, and we'll circulate that at a convenient moment. But I apprehend that the court and everybody will have been using the transcript put into the uh, core bundle. So, I'm, for the purposes of argument, I'll just stick with that if I may. But I think it's right as a matter of technicality that the court should have the weekly law reports. Um, can I, first of all, just deal with a, a, a few things of housekeeping, just so that we all know where everything is? Um, in, for, as far as the bundle is concerned, between us, the parties have lodged a core bundle and a supplementary bundle. I hope that you've got those in, in the usual way. Um, there is also a further supplementary bundle, um, uh, which is quite slim. I've, I've taken to calling it supplementary two, but um, you should have that. And there's also an authorities volume um, of 47 tabs running to about 1,700 pages. It's about two Libra arch files of printed. Uh, and those are the parties' authorities which well, will be Well, can I... My Lord will forgive me because he does everything electronically. Um, I'm the sufferer from this rather than him. I don't know Justice Pottlewell. We've got four Libra arch files. They have no tabs. Uh, and ludicrously... Um, they just split at 500 pages, so each report ends halfway through one report, and a new bundle starts halfway through the next report. Uh, tabs are making it a lot quicker to find and work your way around. Yes. And I don't know who put these bundles together, but if it was the Treasury Solicitor, they must know by now um, uh, the right way to do it. And it's just been extremely inconvenient. Lord, I, right, I said my piece. I entirely see all of that, um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I will make some inquiries as to what's happened. Could you? I don't want to report back, but I do think when thing, mistakes like this happen, it's because people aren't properly trained or explained to them what's required. Yes. And somebody needs to take responsibility for that. Yes. Frankly. And the council need to. Yes. Uh, and and I'll, I'll make sure that all of those lessons are, right. are fed okay. back. Sorry. That, that's Said entirely, my piece. entirely inappropriate. I can, I can see that. <coughs> um, there, there is also, as far as the uh, party is concerned, an additional bundle calling it that because I think that's the title on it and it helps to identify it, which was filed yesterday. Um, I know that Lord Master of the Rolls had a copy yesterday afternoon, as uh, soon as it was filed. Um, uh, but Lord Lord Justice Underhill, Lord Lord Justice Popperwell will have received that this morning, I think, via class. Yeah, well, I had it electronically, but yes, I promise. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, and, and that relates to an application that we make to amend our grounds of appeal to add an additional ground. I'll come back to that if I may, but that's the, the bundle that specifically relates to that. Um, the intervenors' materials um, are, um, a, 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 I think, a little less organised. I don't know the form in which um, the court has that. Um, Lord Justice Dingermans uh, gave permission on the 28th of May uh, of this year. He observed that it was a relatively late application to intervene, and so he limited intervention to 20 pages of written submissions uh, and uh, did not allow oral submissions to be made. And he specifically observed that preparation for the appeal should not be disrupted by the, um, uh, by the intervention, hence his directions. Um, he made no provision for evidence to be achieved. It was literally for 20 pages of written submissions. 
Um, the court, I hope, has the intervener's submissions yeah. somewhere. I think they're loose. Um, I yeah, we've got them have. loose. We've got the their authorities bundle, which overlaps with your authorities yeah. bundle, yes. and we've got the your response to the intervener, which should be in the supplementary uh, supplementary two. Is, is, uh, we we managed to, to put that in there. Um, it's the authorities about which I, I would like to say something. It's mm -hmm. almost five thousand pages of authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, these were made available to us uh, on Monday. I myself first had access to them on Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, th that run of authorities was prepared without any consultation with the parties, uh, with either party, as I understand it. Yeah. Um, so I, I should make that clear at the outset. Much of it duplicates what the parties had already filed, and often in the condensed and, and, and restricted form to concentrate on what was necessary. Um, and um, it in, the intervenors' authorities include inevitably, uh, oh, sorry, include many authorities which the parties would inevitably include in the in the main authorities bundle. So it's entirely unnecessary. And to it's not the subject of council's certificate, presumably. I, I don't think there is a certificate. I, I don't think I've seen one. Um, and in, there is actually even internal duplication in that. Mm. Um, the five thousand pages also rather, if I may say so, lazily incorporate entire statutes of which only tiny parts are relevant um, without any attempt to limit... Well, look, let's not waste time on this, Mr. Uh, well, Chairman. I don't think the court is going to look at that unless somebody refers to it or we're looking at their submissions and we need to refer to an authority that's not in your bundle. It's a completely unsatisfactory way of dealing with the matter and um, it can be dealt with in other ways. We don't well, want to I'm waste time. I've, we need, I've, to, I've get, the point we need to get to the argument in this Indeed. case. Um, so, um, that, that's the bundling. Um, there are three applications in respect of further evidence. Can I just yes. identify them? Because I well, want we to know about on. the application for further evidence. We'll, we'll look at the evidence to Benny SA and deal with it in our judgments. And as far as your application is concerned, you'll make it at the appropriate time in your submission. It, yeah, well, um, I, I think that I, I ought to start with, with, with that application. But that um, may be the appropriate time in your submission. <laughs> Lord, yes, because um, I, I recognise at the outset that the point that we raise um, uh, uh, does, if it is uh, a good one, change the landscape, the entire landscape against which um, these trafficking cases have been dealt with over the last few years. Um, the, our application arises out of a decision of the Supreme Court which was given on Friday of last week. Um, I think I was first aware of it either Monday evening or Tuesday morning during the usual um, dissemination of, of uh, recent authorities. Um, and um, it's immediately apparent that what the Supreme Court has said may have an enormous bearing uh, on the approach to be taken to this case. You say it's a change in the law? Um, it, it, it is, um, in effect, a change in the law. Um, because um, the, the, the courts have, over the last few years, um, adopted a practice of considering international treaties, unincorporated international treaties, uh, and directly deriving um, uh, uh, domestic law rights and obligations from them, especially in, f in fields concerning human rights. Um, Mr. Justice Mostyn's judgment is, in fact, a, a very good example of precisely that going it isn't, on. Is it? It, it, it? He has done a completely conventional thing, which the Secretary of State has never objected to, except once, as you pointed out, in a case where he didn't succeed. Uh, but generally, including in this case, of saying that uh, ECAT is not incorporated, but by a particular line of reasoning, um, uh, it is a, um, in effect, if the policy of the Secretary of State does not comply with ECAT, uh, that will be reviewable at public law because she has said that the whole point of it is to give effect to ECAT. Well, now that is nothing to do with the kind of points that was Lord Reed was concerned with in SC. And anyway, if you didn't like it, you could have objected at the time. Um, uh, well, not, can I can I just Sorry. Um, you know uh, uh, to, to take that in stages? <clears throat> First of all, the policy with which we are concerned is a policy which we acknowledge uh, recognisably uh, seeks to implement at least some of the ECAT obligations. The policy concerned is the discretionary leave policy. 
um, and it, it is discretionally for victims of, of modern slavery. That's, that's what it says. So it covers part of the field um, uh, in which ECAT will impose obligations on the United Kingdom. But the policy itself says nothing, or at least in, nothing in any material part, to promise that it is uh, an implementation of ECAT, <clears throat> or of all of ECAT's obligations in this particular respect. The policy itself is, is one which simply um, uh, uh, sets out circumstances in which discretion may be granted. Um, perhaps it's, it's best, actually, if I'm going to get into the meat of this, to, to, to show the court the policy so, so that um, you can see um, how the, uh, this works. Yeah. Um, it is in the uh, party's authorities um, at... Uh, I hesitate to say this, it's tab 43, it's page 1413. Yeah. <clears throat> and you see on page uh, 1415 uh, that there is a related external link that takes you to the convention. But that's all that the, it says about the convention there. And other than that, the only two references to the convent convention are at 1418. Um, where the, the bullet point uh, under leave is necessary to personal circumstances, under the bullet point to assess whether a grant of leave to recognise victim is necessary for the UK to meet its objective under the trafficking convention. Well, whatever um, might be said about that, that statement in the policy, it doesn't apply to uh, the respondent. Um, and then if you go on to page uh, 1426, uh, under the heading cases involving children, the best in, uh, it says the best interest of, of the child is regarded as a primary consideration. And then it says C section 55 of the 2009 Act and Article 14.2 of the Convention. Other than that, this policy does not purport uh, to um, uh, be a comprehensive implementation uh, of all of ECAT's obligations to uh, grant leave to victims of trafficking or potential victims of trafficking. And so there's, there's no policy statement to that effect. It is simply a policy that talks about granting leave in certain circumstances. Um, and so, against that background, if I can ask you please to go to Mr. Justice Mostyn's uh, judgment. Um, you will see that the argument uh, of the claim set out, well, first of all, um, page, at page 108 in the full bundle, paragraph 34. So is this Mr. Justice Mostyn's judgment? Yes, Mr. Justice Watson, judgment, page... Could you use paragraphs for me? It's paragraph 34 on page 108. Um, the claimant's claim um, argues that defendant's policy of excluding a recipient of reasonable grounds decision from a grant of discretion is unlawful, and two, uh, refu defendant's refusal to treat or refer to the MR NRM as an application barrier of existing leave is likewise unlawful. Further, she argues of discrimination. So that was the original claim. And then if you go on to, uh, at the bottom of that page to paragraph 38, um, uh, therefore, the argument of Lenfrem Swesson was refined during her oral submission. She argued that in circumstances where such gross delays arose, it was incumbent on the defendant <coughs> to include within, within the existing policy terms, which regulated the leave position of a person who had received a positive, reasonable grounds decision. Ms. Weston placed strong reliance on Article 10 2, that's quoted. Um, and then at 39, this makes abundantly clear that following a reasonable grounds decision, leave in some form must be granted to that person. So it's a clear argument that Article 10 2 gives an individual a right to leave, which is not contained in the policy, no, but which he argues the policy It's, it's an argument that the policy, the Secretary of State's policy, ought to give effect. To Article Ten Two, yes. Well, so to put it, but not a, because it's directly applicable, but because that is 
the Secretary of State's proper approach in cases of this kind. Yes. Now, you may say that's right or wrong, but it's not new. And it's well, can, 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 can I do, deal, deal with, with new um, uh, in, in a moment? But, but just, just to, to show exactly what the reasoning is and, and how Mr. Justice, Mos, Mr. Justice Mosman's decision is, is completely within that territory. Um, uh, about which SC has, has now said something. Um, the, 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 whether you look at it as a right claimed by the, um, uh, uh, by the <coughs> claimant or an obligation on the Secretary of State, it remains the case that both the right or the obligation would be uh, under domestic law because o the courts can only enforce domestic law. And so the argument is directly Article 10.2 gives me a right, alternatively imposes an obligation on the Secretary of State, uh, enforceable in domestic law. Uh, and the right or the obligation is to have the policy amended to include um, uh, the, um, uh, to, to include a provision for people in this category. At 40 and 41, Mr. Justice Mostyn deals with the Article 13 argument. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, because although there is a separate point to be made about the merits of it, uh, one can see that this is again um, the respondent calling on a provision of the Convention to create a domestic law right or to, to impose a domestic law obligation on the Secretary of State. Um, at 42, reverting to her primary argument, Ms. Weston submits that the absence of a grant of any leave, kind of leave, however limited, um, uh, is a fatal failure to implement the clear requirement not to remove such a person as provided for in Article 10.2. Again, we say you cannot get clearer than that as a direct call on the treaty. If you are right about this, I'll persuade you at the moment, this is a point you could have made below. Um, Lord, uh, in th in theory, yes. In practice, well, in 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 practice, um, uh, the um, the landscape of all of these points, uh, sorry, the landscape of all these cases, is is one in which this point has not been actively taken. Uh, I've, I think I've given you a reference to the pleadings in this case where we reserve. The well, why does the new authority? make any difference to the argument? How does it change the law that means you suddenly become, um, becomes incumbent upon you to raise it before us in this case? The, 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 reason, the, the reason is, is this. Um, uh, uh, can I ask you to go back to paragraphs 2 and 3 of the, um, of the judgment? 23. Two, 2 and 3. Uh, 2, Mr Justice Mostyn says, um, although ECAT has not been formally in court, it has been held that a failure by the government to apply its principles will be justiciable. So that is that is the background um, uh, of all of these cases up until the decision last Friday, including MS Pakistan, including MS Pakistan, um, because even at Supreme Court level, the, the, um, uh, there has been. Re regular recourse. Nothing, to, nothing in SC overturns MS Pakistan. Well, it was con SC was concerned with a different um, uh, area altogether. Why? Yes, um, I, I understand that, but it's the principle that set out in that part of of SC, which, if applied to um, uh, these, uh, uh, well, a case like like the present case, shows that the reasoning uh, of Mr. Justice Mostyn with uh, um, with respect to him, he was following what had become a conventional approach, including the Supreme Court actually directly looking at whether the UNCRC had been breached by, um, by the UK in deciding whether or not something was, was justified. Um, so right up to the very highest level, um, uh, this, this approach has been taken. And what SC has done is, although it is restating uh, what was traditionally uh, the established law going back to the International Tin Council case, it is in effect a change from the position that had prevailed up until last week, 
where, frankly, there was often a free fall. People just said, look, here, the, this is an un unincorporated convention, but it gives me rights, and this is how the policy should be applied, and this is what the law should be, and this is how this decision ought to be made. And, and what SE has done is said, no, this is wrong, and, and, and in very strong language, too, which, which um, I, I, will, I, I will take you to. That, that, that's, the, that's the change. Now, I, 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 I can see that Learned Friend may uh, wish to say, well, actually, this argument is a, is a bad one, or the current case is in a situation which is distinguishable from the recourse to unincorporated treaties that was in issue in SC, or that there is perhaps some other reason why Mr. Justice Mostyn was right, although not articulated by him as one of his reasons for the decision. Um, and, and there may well be, be, be plenty of uh, additional arguments there. But we respectfully say two things. Um, uh, uh, first of all, this is a point which can now be seen to have real merit on the strength of the judgment in SC. Um, and uh, and when, especially when one looks at how that has changed the general understanding of appro the approach to unincorporated conventions. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, second, um, that uh, this is a point which uh, we should not be shut out from with respect just because it wasn't taken below. I mean, in part because SC does represent a change in the landscape, um, but also because um, the language of the Supreme Court was um, that a court which goes along the, f the, the, the former route of, of looking at these unincorporated treaties and deciding directly whether or not that confers domestic law rights and obligations would be per incuria. That is what SC said. Uh, I, I said it was strong language, and, and I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't resolve from that at all. And we respectfully say that it would be quite a, uh, um, a, a, a <coughs> difficult approach for a court to say, well, you, you can't argue this point because you could have argued it below. Therefore, we're going to approach it on the former understanding of the law, even though the Supreme Court says that that, that would be very pure. And, and so this is a ground for which we respectfully say we, we should be granted permission. Can, can I perhaps show you the, 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 the um, language that was in um, SC? It's in our um, additional bundle. Okay, which additional bundle? The, um... the, the, the application bundle for yeah. amending the grounds. Okay. Uh, it's at tab 5. It, starts it would be at tab 5 if we had tabs. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I was not aware that you didn't have tabs for that either. I don't know why that was. It is page 22. Um, it's easiest to start at page 24 in paragraph 2 because there's a, a summary of the structure of the, the judgment. Um, the subject matter was the uh, benefit cap on child tax credit. Um, at 2 sub paragraph 3, Lord Reed, who's giving the only judgment to support, um, uh, identifies that there's a presumption of discrimination in two respects, <clears throat> one of indirect discrimination of women against men and one of direct discrimination on the ground of gender. And so he has to look at uh, justification. Um, sorry, that's, that's three and, uh, uh, and six. And then at seven, he's looking at justification. And he says that that issue raises three preliminary questions. And the subject matter with which we're concerned is little one whether it is appropriate for our domestic courts to determine whether the UK has violated its obligations under unincorporated international law. That question is answered in the negative. So the first thing that we observe is that this uh, passage is therefore part of the ratio of SC. Um, if you go on to 40, page 47, paragraph 73, um, the... Uh, the, the three preliminary issues are there um, uh, identified again, and at, at uh, 74, a compliance with unincorporated international law. 
Um, and you can see the agreed statement of facts and issues between the parties. Um, and uh, the, the just say, leading counsel for the parties were uh, Richard Drabble, Queen's Counsel, and Sir James Eby, Queen's Counsel. So these are people who are well versed in exactly what the state of play is um, regarding public law. The agreed uh, issue is whether the UK's obligations under the CRC have been breached in the present case. And if so, whether in the circumstances the two-child limit is compatible with convention rights. Now, it's an illustration of where the Supreme Court had hitherto got to in looking at unincorporated conventions. That is highly illuminating because it shows <clears throat> um, uh, the, uh, um, the, the parties expected that the court would look at the question of whether the CRC had been breached. Um, <clears throat> the, the primary question for the court to decide is therefore supposed to be whether the UK has breached its obligations under the UNCRC. The primacy of this question is argued uh, to follow from the decision of this court in DA, um, which is said to be authority for the proposition that a court must, where applicable, assess whether the CRC has been breached. Um, as Council noted, the Court of Appeals approach to the present case is irreconcilable with that proposition. In 75, the first sentence of this approach is mistaken. Um, so that the, the approach that has been built on previous decisions of the Supreme Court itself is mistaken. Um, and at 76, uh, Lord Reed um, uh, restates the um, conventional basis that treaties are agreements between um, the parties, but not contracts which domestic courts can enforce. Um, just for your note, um, the Tin Council case is in tab 8, page 274, of this bundle um, and that paragraph, or that page is at 355. Um, there's a quote, I don't need to read that out. Um, 77, in relation to the second point, it is a fundamental principle of our constitutional law that an unincorporated treaty does not form part of the law of the UK. And then there's another quote from the International Tin Council, you'll find that in this bundle at 356, page 356. Um, and then uh, he says that dictum was cited with approval in, uh, and the principle which it lays down reasserted by 11 justices in Miller, um, as was there explained, the dualist system based on the proposition that international law and domestic law operate in independent spheres is a necessary co uh, corollary of parliamentary sovereignty is only because treaties are not part of UK law and give rise to no legal rights or obligations in domestic law that the prerogative power to make and unmake treaties is consistent with the rule that ministers cannot alter the law of the land. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just if you'll note, Miller is in this bundle at tab 6, starting at page 96. And those three paragraphs are at pages 181, 212, and 237. Um, and then he says the remaining question is whether the Human Rights Act has given domestic legal effect to unincorporated treaties. Clearly, it has not. The only treaty to which the Human Rights Act gives domestic legal effect is the Convention, that's the ECHR. And then at 80, a misunderstanding appears to have arisen in this jurisdiction from the fact that the European Court frequently has regard to international law when interpreting the Convention. And over the next few paragraphs, 81 to 83, he, he deals with that um, and concludes at 84 that there is no basis in the case Strasbourg case law uh, as taken into account under the Human Rights Act for any departure from the rule that our domestic courts cannot determine whether this country has violated its obligations under international, unincorporated international treaties. And then 85, in that regard, however, a misunderstanding has appeared in some recent judgments of this court. I should observe that I, I've, I've used the phrase strong language. Obviously, the judgment is unfailingly polite, as one would expect. Um, but when one looks at what was actually said, it is indeed strong language. Um, the uh, Lord Reed, first of all, looks at um, the uh, uh, couple of decisions of, of the ECHR, and then goes to Domestic Authority 87. The first such case is SG. <coughs> um, and um, at uh, eight, paragraph 88, uh, after having quoted uh, parts of the decision, um, he says, it was, however, accepted by Lord Carnwood um, <coughs> uh, that the question whether the government had complied with the CRC could be relevant to consideration of Article 14 by the Domestic Court he concluded at paragraph 128 that the Secretary of State had failed to establish that the delegated legislation question complied with the UK's obligation under Article 3.1. Those observations were overturned, so he's managed to, Lord Reed has managed to uh, identify that. Um, and then the next case looked at was Matheson, 
Um, I, I should say I will ask you to look at the actual judgment of Matheson in a moment. Um, but uh, you'll see that at 89, 90, and 91, um, uh, Lord Reed discusses that. And at 91, <clears throat> he concludes um, that uh, since Lord Wilson's conclusion that the differential treatment was unjustified was re without reference to international law, but harmonised with his finding that the Secretary of State had violated two unincorporated international treaties, his remarks about international law should not be regarded as forming part of the ratio of the decision. So again, it's, it's sidelining his open. Could you just, just uh, hang on one moment for me, Mr. Tam? I'm, I'm a bit concerned about this derailing the entirety of this hearing uh, about uh, uh, the issues in this case. Um, I wonder if you could just come over. Ms. Weston, um, you've obviously had a limited opportunity, as we have, to look at this point. Um, 
just in a nutshell, um, what do you say about it, and what do you say about the time it would take you to argue if it were if it were allowed to argue the point Mr. Tan is trying to make? Um, I think it's right that um, Lord Justice Dingerman's observed that one day was already a tight time. Could you take your mask? Sorry. Off? <laughs> <laughs> one day was already a tight time scale. I think um, mm. for, for the points um, as originally pleaded. Um, we would need some time to prepare the substantive submissions, which is, I don't think I'd be doing a disservice by describing it as driving a cart and horses through the last five to ten years of trafficking law. So if, 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 if um, Mr. Tam is, is, is right that the, that the point's properly engaged. So, so, so if we were to say, we'll deal with the appeal as we thought it was, um, today, we'll hear argument on it, um, and if we come to the conclusion at the end of the day that we um, think that um, Mr. Tam would otherwise lose, so he needs this to win, and we think it is acceptable for him to raise it, which we have no view about at the moment, we've only heard him on that, um, then we would have to set a timetable in some way for it to be dealt with. But um, we can hear the argument without this. Um, I mean, do you think that's a satisfactory approach? I have to say that's not something that I contemplated. I had assumed that if the court was minded to grant Mr. Tam permission, then I'd be asking for the, the matter to be adjourned. So I hadn't, I hadn't thought through that. Um, right. Uh, I mean, the, Mr. Tam, what do you say about that? I mean, one of the things that I have a personal concern about, but not shared by, by my lord, or one of my lords at least, is that that this is really intertwined uh, with the substantive argument that you would have addressed without it. Is that right or is that wrong, as, as uh, could be suggested? Um, we would respectfully say that's not the position here. Right. Um, and the reason I say that is because, unlike some of the policies looked at in previous cases in which the concession was first made that ECAT was justiciable in domestic courts, uh, as I've shown you, this policy says virtually nothing about the Convention. It's recognizably trying to implement part of the Convention. I accept that. But it, the policy itself doesn't say that. The contrast is with earlier policies considered in, especially at Tamiwan, where the concession, I think, was first made, and in Galdicus, where the concession was not made, was a policy which expressly said, we're implementing ECAP by doing this. And, and that so, was so you can argue that... The point is, you can argue your appeal perfectly satisfactorily without this point. Um, um, yes, I, I, I think that I, I can do that. Um, the caution that I would urge is simply that if the Supreme Court is right um, in its description of this approach as per incurium, and if the court were to accept my submission that that applies um, to or that the, the, the um, reiteration in SC applies to this case, that all of what I would be arguing, or certainly at least ground one, which is the main ground of the appeal, um, is actually forbidden territory <clears throat> in which this court should not be walking at all. I think that that's the that's the the, the, the main that point that I'm. Making? What do you mean by forbidden well, territory? That the, this court should not be looking the question of whether um, the, the Secretary of State's policy is in breach of an unin unincorporated international treaty. It, it's simply beyond the well, we jurisdiction. Do, we do, we do, well, it's not beyond the jurisdiction. It's, it's, it's just a point of law on which it would be a wrong point of law on which we were considering your case. But that's there's nothing morally or constitutionally no. wrong in doing that. That happens, sometimes happens. Yes. Uh, um, n n morally, no, but with respect constitutionally, it is um, what the SC is saying is that this is outside the competence, if I can use that word rather than technical jurisdiction, outside the competence of municipal courts. That there may be a question mark about, about when the court, a uh, situation where the no, no one is, just be clear about this, no one is suggesting that it is directly applicable. There you might have a, even there, I'm not really sure I call that a constitutional. Um, 
what you're saying is that a particular route by which it is said to be indirectly applicable doesn't work. But that's hardly a constitutional outrage. Um, no, I, I, I'm not saying it's a constitutional outrage. <laughs> I'm constitutionally uh, wrong. Uh, uh, putting it too high, but, but it, it, um, uh, the, the basis of Mr. Justice Mawson's decision, I didn't actually get to his conclusion when, when looking at his judgment. But, but the, Mr. Justice Mawson's decision was entirely, Article 10.2 gives the claimant a right or imposes an obligation on the respondent, and the respondent has failed to comply with that obligation. It's directly applied. But if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you're right on your original arguments that Mr. Justice Mostyn was wrong as a matter of construction of 10.2, then the constitutional question doesn't arise. Right. That's, that's an additional yes. reason. Yes. If, on the other hand, you're wrong, then the, the constitutional point, as you, as you characterise it, arises. Um, so I, I accept that, that that is a way of, of looking at it, and, and I'm, I'm not saying it would be impossible for this court to... No, but, but you're saying something else. You're saying you shouldn't be looking at Article 10.2 as if it is, as if it even could give them a right. Yes, it would be inappropriate so, in so any circumstances. So our giving judgment to say Article 10.2 does not give EOG a right, X, Y, and Z, or Article 13 does not give the EOG a right, X, Y, Z, unless that was dressed up as being included in a policy which could be reviewed, would be something we were not permitted to do. Um, I think that um, having heard you both on this, we'll rise for a sh okay. short time just to think about it. My Lord, I actually haven't finished what Sorry. I'd like to say to the court because I don't agree with Mr. Tam's characterization of the way the policy point arises. It's not right. simply about Mr. Mr. Tam and Ms. with respect to him eliding the issue of a policy, a policy which deals expressly with discretionary leave in Article 14 terms, that's to say what happens after a person gets the CG, which we say doesn't deal with the issue that we, we say is required to be dealt with. He's eliding the question of that policy, which we say is defective, with the policy of the government, which is through Section 49 of the Modern Slavery Act, statutory guidance issued under that section, and policy guidance issued separately, but related policy guidance, the policy of the government to meet its obligations as expressed in ECAT, Well, I mean, I completely understand materials. that. That's your argument as to how it comes in, even if he's right. But, but it doesn't meet the point as to whether he is right. Well, what, I think it, it goes back to my Lord's observation about the intertwining of the issues arising. And at the moment, certainly with very, short, with very little time to prepare my response, I can see difficulties arising um, in, in that context because what the Secretary of State is with respect to her appearing to, 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 to be doing here is to say that notwithstanding that we are arguing these uh, matters through the prism of what the Secretary of State's position is, as to the way in which she has chosen to um, implement uh, ECAT in its terms, but that is not justiciable. And um, I, at the moment, I'm seeing difficulties, and I'm sort of my mind's running through the various strands of case law mm. um, about how um, Mr. Tam is going to avoid straying into um, those areas. And even if he... If, even so what, are you, what are you saying, Ms. Weston? I mean, I, I get all that, actually. Um, it was actually very much what I was thinking. Um, does that lead you to the conclusion that even if he were to be permitted really to cite um, SC, uh, we, you would be put in difficulty because you would be not prepared. 
Well, well, exactly. I mean, that was my, my first reaction was, is it necessary to seek a ground of appeal to argue what the impact is of a recent Supreme Court decision? <laughs> answer, no. The answer, yes. If you're this, residing, this is a new point. If you're residing, yes, exactly. This is a, this, if it's a good point, it's a new point, for which permission to amend is needed, yes. uh, as, and that's why he's asking for it. Yes. Don't it? Mm. I've got but, anxieties but about what, proceeding like, without just without express your that. anxieties in um, express your anxieties in the form of a submission as to what we should do. It may not be the best use of court time to go through a day's argument, touching on these issues, possibly weaving in and out of them, only for the conclusion to be one that the court has to go and revisit in light of what. Um, flows from well, Mr. Tam says flows so you're from asking C. For an to deal yeah. with it seems to me that these things the should be dealt with comprehensively, yeah. yes. Um, much as I'm reluctant to do so. I have to say that if I, I, th I think it right that we would have pleaded out our case very differently had not the Secretary of State made the concession in her SGDs and DGDs that this issue was in principle justiciable. That's to say, failure to reflect um, the, uh, the, in the same way as, the, as um, I think it was Mr Justice Bourne dealt with the matter in, um, in JP, which was about right to work, and basically there was a bright line rule in that case, and the Bourne J's response was, well, no, actually, you have to have sufficient flexibility. <laughs> Is that case being appealed? Um, I, I don't think so. May I turn my back? I think my understanding is it has not been appealed, no. Right. But but so so there is an express concession in this case on the back of which we pleaded it, pleaded it, um, pleaded our. But, our all this, but all that goes to the question whether there should be whether it be fair for there to be permission to amend. Can I, with my lord's permission, just ask one thing? If we were to adjourn, probably the strictly logical position would be that there would have to be effectively two further hearings there would have to be a hearing to decide whether this point should be taken, should be allowed to be taken. And uh, then there would have to be the substantive appeal, either on the basis that it was allowed to be taken or that it wasn't. If you rolled the two up, you would be essentially in the same position as we're in now, uh, only with this difference, that um, uh, you'd have had more time to think about it. But uh, we'd still not know how the substantive appeal was going to go on until we had decided the first point. Unless we were prepared to just, well, do that at 12 o'clock and then move on to the... We'd be in just the same problem. So are we in... I just wanted to explore with you what, the, if we were to adjourn, what, whether it would in fact have to be to allow this application to be decided first. Um, I, I mean, in principle, I don't see why the application shouldn't be considered on the paper, so if we had a reasonable amount of time to put in written submissions about the merits... You're, you're opposing the application. Um, I'm sorry? You, you oppose the application, obviously. Um, or not? I, I think my position was I'm in the hands of the court, save that if the court goes ahead and grants the application I, I'm not in a position to proceed. I mean, the, the, just to put to you the, the opposing view, and you can see that there are you know, we're, this is all coming a bit fresh, but um, you, you know, I would suggest that arguing this case without this point uh, leaves an elephant in the room, which makes everybody in a bad position if anybody wanted to take whatever we decide <laughs> further. And, and they'd say, well, you, you, you haven't considered the sort of very latest um, discussion, which is the underpinning of the debate. And it would be not beneficial to any party to proceed on some um, basis when, when one party is saying in the strongest terms I've heard for a long time, I need this ground, even if you don't think I do, I don't want you deciding this case on the basis of a, a false premise, as I understand Mr. Mr. Tam to say on behalf of the government, which is a you know, perfectly uh, understandable position. And I, I'm interested to know what you think in answer to that. Do you say, no, you can perfectly properly decide this case without any reference to SC. That's what would have happened last week, and there's no reason why it shouldn't happen this. Or do you say, I sort of get that? 
I Lord, I'm, I'm not, I don't have instructions to concede the application. I can see pragmatically. No, no, no. That they I'm would, not asking you to concede yeah. it. Yes, uh, that I can see pragmatically that um, uh, running through the permutations on my way to court this morning, I was thinking, what's to stop the Secretary of State on the back of SC saying, we've changed our policy, therefore we're just going to ignore all the last um, case law, which could also happen. I mean, it may be that, 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 the, that the courts court should, as I say, deal with the elephant in the room, but I'll put it no higher than that. Yes, okay. Mr. Tam? <clears throat> um, well, I, I don't think I can add anything to that. I think Ms. Weston said the court should deal with the elephant in the room. In, in, indeed, and, and, and need an adjournment, and, and if, if that is what is needed, I, uh, in these circumstances, I cannot possibly oppose it. Well, uh, I, I understood Ms. Weston say she couldn't make the concession yet, that it must deal with the elephant in the room, but that it would be appropriate to deal with that application on paper which might not be opposed on paper, uh, and if it were, the, the grounds could be dealt with on paper. Have I understood correctly? Um, yes, the question of whether permission should be granted whether or not permission should be granted. could be dealt with on the papers, that did seem to me to be appropriate. And, Sorry, and, yes. and Mr. Tam, would you be content, if I may? Lord, yes. Would you be content for that application to be dealt with on paper? Indeed, yes. So, I'm just thinking aloud, if we adjourn, uh, we adjourn with uncertainty as to whether my Lord is right, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Underhill is right, and we have to have two applications, because when you look at it on the papers, you might say, come to a conclusion you need an oral hearing for a difficult question like that. Um, I or, suppose, sorry, I yeah. shouldn't, I yeah. shouldn't think, think aloud over, over my Lord. We have to remind ourselves, of course, the application is only whether the point should be allowed to be argued. Um, that perhaps, uh, particularly if in the end it was opposed and Mr. Weston's had a mm. chance to think about it, uh, that easily could be dealt with on paper. And then it would simply be another ground in the case. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> this might be a little a big one, but um, I mean, I think we'll adjourn now for just a moment, if we may, to consider what we're going to do. All right. Rise. So, Mr. Tam, uh, Ms. Weston, thank you uh, very much for your helpful submissions on both sides. Uh, we've decided that um, it isn't satisfactory to leave the elephant sitting in the room 
without a determination as to whether it's an elephant or a mouse. That may be slightly <coughs> opaque, so let me say it in clearer and more legal terms. We're going to adjourn uh, this appeal. Um, we're going to indicate, Miss Weston, that we think it would be preferable to um, allow the Secretary of State to raise this ground, but we're not going to stop you opposing his application, her application to do so. Um, and you can put in whatever um, submissions you think appropriate. If, and we'll deal with those on paper, if we do permit the Secretary of State to raise the new ground, uh, then at the adjourned hearing everything will be dealt with and we think a minimum estimate of two days is appropriate, and we will try and convene the same court um, to hear it. We think it's sufficiently important to um, obviously uh, give it proper attention and better than trying to rush it today in all the circumstances. And it's not anybody's fault that the Supreme Court gave judgment last Friday without asking us what was in our docket this week, uh, which we wouldn't expect them to do. So that's how we'll deal with it. Would it be possible for you to uh, make your written submissions to us within, um, I was thinking really by next Wednesday, say at four o'clock? May I turn my back for a moment? Yes. Um, what um, my Lord is suggesting is that in the light of uh, the way it's not definitely but probably going to pan out, um, it might be safer to estimate three days on the grounds that there are likely to be interveners who will make an application, if, if only the present interveners, to make oral submissions on the point of this kind, which they wouldn't have wanted to do before. Uh, we're not encouraging anybody do so, they will have to sat satisfy the usual rules, uh, but we will, for safety's sake, list it for three days in the event that we allow the application. If we don't allow the application, um, well, we'll look at it when we don't. Lord, yes. M Lord, whilst um, we're thinking about the, the future direction, if our application uh, were to be allowed, um, can, can I say this? I, I don't say any of this in a partisan way, but it's simply to try and help the, the smooth running. Um, I, I, I've been thinking through the consequences of what um, EOG might argue if um, we are granted permission and the SC point is a sound one. Um, I, I take this because it's been trailed in the skeleton, in Learner Friend's skeleton argument and in what she said today. Um, it is. Uh, um, uh, it, it appears to be a potential argument by Learned Friend um, that Article 4 of the ECHR uh, or the Trafficking Directive, which I think is still in force uh, at the moment, would get you to the same place yes, as I Article 10. Yes, that's a great point. Yes. Um, and then uh, she mentioned today the uh, Modern Slavery Act and a potential, uh, I hope I'm, um, I'm not misrepresenting this, a potential argument that the Secretary of State is in breach of a statutory duty under the Modern Slavery Act, um, and uh, by that route to get to impugning the discretionary leave policy. Um, uh, what uh, I was going to observe, because I hadn't quite actually got to Mr Justice Mostyn's conclusion, was that in his um, judgment, the only reason he cites is Article 10.2. The directive is not actually mentioned a single time in the judgment. And the ECHR only mentioned in passing in relation to other things. So if Melena Friend does want to raise those arguments, she needs a response. Response yes. notice. Um, and, and so although I don't think there's any need for a formal direction today, I thought I would ventilate that because it may be a consequence of this. And then if there is a respondent's notice, then we'll have to look at that and, and reshape all our arguments if accordingly. You, if, you, if you hadn't raised it, I would. Those points <laughs> well, across my mind as well. Yes. I'm grateful. Um, so I, I, I mention that because I don't want it to be a surprise later on. 
Yeah. Well, um, can I um, then suggest that my lord will deal with these um, interlocutory matters on behalf of the court? Um, obviously, he'll refer to other members of the court as necessary, but he'll deal with that and give directions as appropriate. But, Ms. Weston, you're on notice now that you may want to amend your respond existing respondent's notice if permission is granted. And um, I will, as I say, for, for listing purposes, say three days. Uh, but anything the parties can do to ascertain um, at least at, at least um, some indication of where interveners are likely to come from would be helpful. Uh, because we don't uh, want to have late interveners. Uh, and, and of course, if, if anything um, happens to change the estimate or whatever, we'll let the court know. It's, it's not, not for us to say who should intervene, but the existing interveners have a track record in this particular area. Uh, and uh, if they wish to continue their intervention, on this new point, I suspect they may, and to make oral submissions on it. Um, without wanting to discourage anyone else, it's hard to see any, there's any more appropriate intervener than them, given, as I say, their long record in this area. Yes. And, and I, I'm sure the court will have noticed that SC also had something to say about interveners, but we'll leave, leave, that, um, leave that be. Uh, uh, could I just raise one very small housekeeping point? Oh, yes. um, apart from already made. We'll have, I hope, better bundles next time. Um, the supplementary bundle it, it didn't contain two things which I was half expecting to see. One is the claimant's own witness statement. Now, it might well be logical, and it might, might be logical to be left out if a view has been taken, we don't need to see it. So be it. But I wonder whether that was a deliberate omission. Uh, and secondly, I would have welcomed seeing, although it's only background, the, uh, the paperwork about her particular case, the letters that she wrote and the letters she got from the Home Office. Now, they do appear rather piecemeal as exhibits to some witness statements from her solicitor, but they must, that's not the form in which they were presumably before the bundle, before the um, court below, and it'd be just most convenient to have, have them in a single run of documents. We'll, we'll, we'll check all that and, and, and make sure that what is logical and helpful is there next time round. Um, we, we, it may be an idea that we should just revamp all of the bundles for, for next time, given that the shape of the case may, may be very different depending on the court's decision. Yes. Well, in that, in that um, in those circumstances, we'll adjourn this case on the terms indicated. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and I'm very sorry we've had to do so, but I think there's no real um, alternative.